Well, today, my guest is renowned neurosurgeon Dr. Michael Egnor to begin talking with me about his new book, The Immortal Mind, a neurosurgeon's case for the existence of the soul. Dr. Egnor is a professor of neurosurgery and pediatrics at State University of New York, Stony Brook. Named one of New York's best doctors by New York Magazine in 2005, Egnor is an award-winning brain surgeon who has performed over 7,000 brain operations. Dr. Agnor, thank you for taking the time with us today. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you've written a book, an extraordinary book, uh, an intriguing book, making a case that the human soul exists and that the mind is immortal. And over a couple of episodes of the Idea of the Future podcast, I'd like to unpack some of the arguments and evidence that you've marshaled for these provocative ideas. Now, today, I'd like to tease out some of the key insights of your book, and in a separate episode, we can get into a little more detail and examples. Now, let's start with some helpful definitions. I always like to start by, you know, uh, verifying terms and making sure we're all on the same page. How do you, as a neurosurgeon, define brain, mind, and soul? Well, the brain is an organ. It's an organ like the heart is an organ or the kidney or the liver. And it has certain jobs that it does, certain functions. Uh, and um, it's not the same thing as the mind, and it's not the same thing as the soul. Uh, the mind um, is a several aspects of the soul, um, and I'll get to that in a moment. The, the, the soul is what makes the difference between a living body and a dead body, uh, and that's Aristotle's def definition, and I think he got it right. Um, a soul is everything you do that characterizes you as being a living person. That is, a soul involves your heart beating and your lungs breathing. It involves your vision and your hearing and your, your capacity for reason and free will. All of that together, collectively, is your soul. Um, one way of thinking of it is that your soul is everything that's true about you the moment before you die, subtracted from that the moment after you die. So it, it's your soul is your principle of life. And the mind is kind of a modern idea. The ancients didn't really think of things in terms of the, of the mind. They thought of things only in terms of the soul. Uh, the mind is um, the powers of the soul that we associate with um, perception, with memory, with emotion, uh, with abstract thought, and with free will. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Now, neuroscientists have different opinions of the mind and whether it exists independently of the brain or not. Can you explain the difference between the materialist view and the dualist view? The materialist view is that in one way or, or another, everything that goes on in the mind is generated by the brain, uh, that there is no remainder, there's no aspect of the mind that is not dependent completely on brain activity. And there are three kinds, general kinds of materialist perspectives on that. One is a, re, is a reductionist perspective. A reductionist believes that everything in the mind is completely reducible to what's in the brain. Uh, and the most common reductionist viewpoint is identity theory, which says that what's in our mind is really the same thing as what goes on in our brain, just understood from a different perspective. Uh, there's a non-reductionist kind of materialism that believes that everything that happens in the mind is completely dependent on what happens in the, in the brain. But the mind, it can't be simply reduced to the brain, but everything in the mind is generated by the brain. And the third is the eliminative materialist viewpoint, that the mind doesn't exist, that, it's, that, that the, the concept of the mind is what they call folk psychology, meaning it's just kind of a common mistake and we don't really have minds. We just have brain pro processes that we mistakenly interpret as being a mind. The, okay. du the dualist view viewpoint is that um, there certainly is quite a bit that goes on in, in the mind that indeed is generated by, by the brain. Dualists very much believe in the mind-brain interaction. But dualists argue that there are aspects of uh, the mind that while brain function may be necessary for the normal exercise of that aspect of the mind, brain function is not sufficient. That there's, there's something extra that goes into what makes us human that does not come from, from the brain. Okay. And you hold the dualist view, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and we'll, we'll unpack that more as we go. Okay. Now, 
One of the things I've learned from scientists working on the evidence for intelligent design is that it's helpful to draw up a set of observations that you'd expect if a given hypothesis were to be true. In your book, you relay five propositions from Yale University neuro neurologist uh, Stephen Novella in support of the materialist view. For example, no mental phenomena without brain function. As brain function is altered, the mind will be altered. If the brain is damaged, then mental function will be damaged, and so on. And then you turn around and you offer up five alternative propositions one would expect given a dualist view. For example, there will be some mental phenomena without brain function. As brain function is altered, the mind will not necessarily be altered. If the brain is damaged, mental function will not necessarily be damaged, and so on. So why is looking at what you'd expect to see if a given hypothesis is correct a helpful way to evaluate a view of the mind? Um, it's helpful because science works particularly well when um, people who have a theory um, have to give predictions as to what the logical consequences of their theories are. Um, and Einstein found, found this when he developed the theory of relativity. It made very specific predictions, for, for example, about the bending of light as it goes around the sun. And that could be tested, and it was tested. So there are ways of testing uh, materialist views of the mind, and there are ways of testing dualist views of the mind. And, and those, um, those uh, propositions that you mentioned earlier uh, are um, a very useful way to test these theories. Yeah, and those are in your book, so readers can consult those, as well as see how your propositions shake out throughout the course of your, your arguments. So I think it's uh, very helpful that you included that. Mm -hmm. Now, your book provides evidence that the mind is distinct from the brain and that the human mind can adapt to a variety of brain absences. You tell the story as an example of one of your patients, Sam, uh, who suffered from debilitating epileptic seizures. You performed a split brain procedure, literally splitting in two the corpus callosum, the massive bundle of millions of nerve fibers that connect the two hemispheres of the brain. What was the result of this surgery then? And how does it support your argument about the unity of the mind? Uh, split brain surgery is a remarkable kind of operation um, that surprises people that we can actually do it. But in, but in, but in fact, it's, 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 it's safe. It's uh, done with some fre frequency e even today. And I've, I've done it in the past. Um, the most remarkable thing about split brain surgery is, number one, it, it can be a fairly effective way to treat certain kinds of seizures. Um, the second most remarkable thing is that people don't change much except they have fewer seizures. That is that they still feel like they're one person. Um, they actually feel completely normal after split brain surgery. Um, mm -hmm. There's a neuroscientist named Roger Sperry who studied split brain patients many years ago, and he won the Nobel Prize for his studies. And he found that there were subtle perceptual problems in people with split brain surgery, problems they generally don't even notice in everyday life. But it helped Sperry to understand the function of the individual brain hemispheres. Uh, so it was really good science. Um, other researchers, uh, Justine Surgeon at McGill and Yair Pinto in the Netherlands, have studied these patients in more detail over the past number of decades. And what they found is a remarkable thing. With split brain surgery, the hemispheres of, of the brain are functionally dis disconnected. And you can present an image to the individual hemispheres that the other hemisphere doesn't see. So you can present uh, an, like an arrow to one hemisphere and another arrow to the other hemisphere. And you can ask the patient, do these arrows point in the same direction or different directions? And people with split brain surgery almost always get the right answer. But if you think about it, no part of their brain has seen both arrows. One part saw one arrow, the other part saw the other arrow. Nothing in their brain saw both arrows, but they're able to compare the arrows, which implies that there's a part of their mind that's not in their brain. Huh, that's fascinating. Uh, 